there was a lady named um, Sharon. And um, Sharon was, um, worked in an office building. And every time they had company parties, she just would not go. But there's this one time that Sharon knew she had to go because it was one of her friend's birthday parties inside the office. And so they had a room back here that everybody goes into for, uh, they had tables and everything, and they put a cake and they put out snacks and they had um, all the birthday stuff for this employee. And sure enough, Sharon went in and looked at the cake and the, the ice cream and the cookies and just everything, and she just craved all those sugary things. But she didn't stay. She just went ahead and sang happy birthday, talked to her um, friends, and then made her way right out the door and back into her office space. Everybody knows that that's Sharon. Because Sharon is on a diet. All of a sudden, a little while back, she went on a diet. We don't understand it, is what they all said. She's not that much overweight. But Sharon will not eat anything with sugar in it. What they didn't know was that Sharon had made a promise to God. I wouldn't say a promise, just a, just a deal. <laughs> you ever made a deal with God? <laughs> yeah, sometimes that doesn't work out so well, does it? God, if you get me through this, I'll never do it again. <laughs> and two weeks later, oops, did it again. <laughs> um, so um, promising God things is interesting, but here's the deal. Is Sharon has a son named Josh. Now, Josh is in his 20s now. But back in high school, she used to take him and drop him off at high school, and then she'd go to work. There was one time that she got a call from the school, even before she got to work. She got a call on her cell phone and says, um, we just want to know um, why Josh has been missing school for so many days. She's like, I drop him off every day. He hasn't missed a day in a long time. And they go, well, no. Just this week he's missed four days. She's like, I just dropped him off this morning. Come to find out, Josh had been getting around some different kind of friends, and those friends would go out and miss school, and then they would start um, doing a little bit of drinking and then getting into a little bit of drugs, and eventually that had become an addiction for him. And so now, with or without his friends, he would miss school and go out and spend time alone with um, a little alcohol and um, eventually became what they call a crack addict. It became so bad that his life began to change. The sh Sharon said, How, why didn't I see that? Well, Josh was really good at hiding it. Well, after all these years, it cost him his job. It cost him his um, um, friendships with so many d good friends. And it cost him uh, family life that he had. It, all of a sudden, these drugs and this alcohol had taken over his life. He couldn't keep a job. He couldn't keep friends. He, his family was messed up. He's been in and out of sober living homes and trying to get better. In January, Sharon finally said, I've had enough. See, what the office people didn't know or what it, no one else even knew. See, Sharon kept it, kept it a secret. It was a deal between her and God. And she said, God, I am going to fast. I will not eat anything with sugar in it, no sweets at all, even though I love them, until my son is clean for 365 days. Until that day, this is what I'm going to do. She says, I only did it because God laid it on my heart that I need to stand up for my son. I need to bring my son to the presence of God every day. It says, if I'm not eating sweets and I'm not eating these things, I know that I'm going to bring every time that I think about sweets and candy, um, cake, I'm going to remember to pray to God and say, please help my son. So that's what she began to do. And in February, he calls and goes, Mom, I've checked myself in. 
and I'm getting help. She said, right away, she saw it. It's like God had just said, look, I'm blessing you. I'm taking care of your son because you have stayed um, true to what I've asked you to do. So she continued to fast, and she knows that February of next year, she knows that she's going to see that her son has made it through. She'd go to office parties after that with a much stronger will to not eat anything of the sweets or cakes or any party that they have. She's bold and she's strong. A few months down the line, her daughter, who was engaged, had to go and pick out the birthday cake. Birthday cake. Hmm. How about a wedding cake? Did anybody catch that? Are you guys asleep? All right, all right. Yeah, you you can't let me get away with that stuff. Uh, Went and picked out the uh, wedding cake. When they started picking out the wedding cake, you're going to pay a lot of money for these cakes. This is not the average cake. This is the cake. How can you pay for the cake? The daughter says (laughs) to the mom. Remember, the daughter doesn't know why mom's not eating sweets but she looks over to mom and says how can we pay for this cake if you don't at least try it this is expensive why why would we serve something that we don't know what it tastes like she goes you go ahead she goes mom come on it just takes that one come on before mom had that struggle between this is my daughter's wedding and this is an expensive cake And for this time, this time, I'll do it. They took that little, cute little plate that they have at the the wedding um, cake-making place. Um, They put that little cake on top of that cute little plate with a cute little fork. And she took it, and she took that little bite, and she, she, she ate it. And it was instantly a guilt and shame that went throughout her body. She said she felt it. It was so bad. It was the instant that her mouth closed, that there was a guilt. She knew she had broken her promise. She knew that her son's life was on the line. Everything that she had prayed to God for and promised God, I'll do this for 365 days until my son is clean, and all of a sudden it's done and it's over. She didn't want her daughter to see, but she just felt it inside. And so she went ahead and said, yes, that cake's fine. And um, they went ahead and um, placed the order. And then she went home and just in tears. Because she had let God down and she had let her son down. In John 6.38, it says this. It says, Jesus is speaking. He says, I came down from heaven. I left heaven. Not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father. I left heaven. Just stop right there. Focus on those words. I left heaven. I came down from heaven. What does that mean? So you don't you don't even need to read the rest yet. What does it mean I came down from heaven? It means I left perfection, I left glory, I left magnificence, I left the best place ever. God left his throne to come here to be as sinful like us without sin. <laughs> Just this man, this human, to live here amongst us. He left everything to come here to be one of us so that he could die on the cross. He knew that from the very moment that he left heaven, he knew that he was coming here to die. He's leaving as the creator to come here to be amongst the creation, to let the creation, us, destroy him. To let us nail him to a cross 
to kill the creator. How much love is a God that says the only way to save them is to go there and die for them? The Bible says there is no greater love than one that will give their life for their friend. There is no greater love than the fact that God left heaven, a place that he will never die, a place where he has all power. But he came here as one of us. He took on flesh to die on a cross, to pour out his blood so that we can be cleansed from all of our sin. He died on that cross to raise from the dead. He defeated death. The one thing that we all fear, we all fear death because that's our last day. That's the day that we take our last breath, our last heartbeat. Death is scary. Until Jesus came here and beat the snot out of it. Until Jesus came here and said, you have no sting. Until Jesus came here and said, everything that everybody fears, I'm going to take away that fear. Death has no power for the ones that follow me. Because three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, never, ever to die again. The significance of Jesus leaving heaven to come here to be with us shows that he is not someone that stands around and says, I am so blessed that I'm going to help you. You guys are a bunch of sinners and I'm going to help you because I'm better than you. He came down here to be one of us, to say, I'm on your level and I'm going to help you. See, the thing wrong with Christianity today, especially whenever we go feed the homeless or we go and we help somebody who's in need, whenever we take bags of groceries over to somebody's house, we go over there with our chest poked out. We're not humble. God's blessed me with a job and I have good money coming in and I'm going to help you. I know you're a miserable little person. <laughs> See, I don't say those words. You know what? We don't have to say the words. We do it with that pride that we go over. I'm going to help you. You know what? Go over there as someone who is just as poor and just as hurting and help them from that level and you'll see a response you've never seen before. The reason that we have such a, a hard time with the people that are living on the streets is because we are so much more blessed than them. We always have an excuse of why they ended up on the streets. Oh, they didn't go to school. They did drugs. They drank. They did this. You know, stop it. Let's just help people where they're at. Jesus left heaven. Can't you leave your miserable little home that you have and go and help people on a level that you actually care for them on their level? You know what? I am one breath away from death. I am one heartbeat away from death, just like everybody else. I am a pastor of a church, but in one moment I could lose my place here. I have income coming in, but it only takes one decision by a manager or a boss or uh, an employer to say you're no longer employed here. Whenever we go out and we help the lost and we help the poor, let's realize how close we are to being in their place. Jesus didn't do it from on high. He came and he ate with the prostitutes. He ate with the sinners around a table. They all ate together. Yes, he was sinless. But he ate with the people who had sin. He dined with them. In Revelation, it says, I'm at the door and I'll knock and anyone that will open that door, I'll come in and dine with you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And if you'll just open up your heart, he says, I'll come in, man. But he goes, I'm not going to push my way in. I'm not going to just jump in. I'm not going to knock the door down. I'm just going to knock. I'm just going to knock at your heart and say, can I come in? He says, if you'll open the door, how do you open the door? It's by believing and repenting. If you believe in him and you repent of your sins, if you repent of um, deserting him, if you repent of not having a relationship with him, if you repent of disobeying him, then you've opened the door. And he says, if you open the door, I'll come in. 
and I'll dine with you. I'll eat with you. He's not going to come in the house and start saying, hey, wow, we got to tear that down, tear that down. He says, I'm going to come in and eat with you. We're going to have fellowship together. You know, maybe the people on the streets and maybe your friends and neighbors who aren't as blessed as you are, maybe you just walk in and say, hey, I, I love it here. I'm just going to come in and hang out with you. Go sit at the table. It's fellowship. The problem we have as Christians sometimes is we think we're so blessed that we can't see other people as um, being so close to us. The Bible says we were all sinners. There's not one better than the other. What I've been forgiving, forgiven for, everybody can be forgiven for. I'm no better than anybody else. Sharon, Sharon had a really hard time. In fact, she couldn't even call Josh, who's in the sober living home, trying to get better, trying to stay away from drugs and alcohol. She couldn't even call him on the phone. The guilt was so much. So she wrote it in a letter. Put it in an envelope and mailed it off. He got the letter and he read it and he called her on the phone right away. He says, Mom! I got your letter. She goes, it's just in tears. She goes, son, I'm so sorry. She goes, I, I told you everything that happened in the letter. I told God that I was going to fast until you were 365 days clean. And I failed. He goes, I just couldn't do it. I mean, it was the temptation was so much. It's like every day I would look at the candy at the office or at the store. And she goes, I would always be tempted. And she goes, finally, it was that one conversation that I had. And I had to eat the cake. It was like a struggle every day. She goes, I'm sorry I didn't make it. He goes, Mom, that's the best thing I've ever heard. She goes, what? Because you totally understand now what I go through with drugs and alcohol. Because every day I want it and I have to fight it. And when I give in, I feel a guilt that is so awful. She goes, so now I know that you know what I'm going through. See, the Bible in Galatians 6, um, 6, 2 through 5 says that we are to take on each other's burdens. See, Sharon had taken on the burdens of her son and God wasn't saying, go and fast so that I'll answer your prayer. That wasn't the trick. Jesus had told Sharon, go and fast and stay away from something that you really like and then you'll understand what Josh is going through. So when you pray, you'll understand. That's why he goes through every stinking day because addictions are that bad. Sharon said, once I saw it, man, I prayed a prayer like I've never prayed before for my son. And then I saw that I didn't fail. It was an eye-opening experience to see the struggles that people go through that I could have never related to previously. If we're going to go out and to, as Christians, as a church, and we're going to go out and present Jesus Christ, do not go out there like you have never sinned. Go out there as a sinner who has been forgiven, and we understand the struggles that people go through. Stop going around like, I've never done anything wrong. No, you have done things wrong. You've just been cured because Jesus Christ came into your life and he healed you and you don't do it any longer. But if you do, <laughs> nah, once I got saved, I don't sin anymore. Really? That's what's destroying the world right now. Because we're so good, nobody can ever be as good as us. No, you need to tell them, you know what? I don't sin every day. I don't mess up every day. I try my best to live a Christian life, but there's those days when somebody cuts me off on the freeway and my hand goes up and I'm not waving. <laughs> oh, I feel bad I did it. but oh. You know what? Sinners need to know that we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. And we're going to try our best 
with the power of our spirit in God, our, our Holy Spirit that now lives within us, we are going to do our best. But people need to st- stop looking at us like we don't fail. We fail. But when we do, we get on our knees and we pray. We pray and we ask God for forgiveness. Please forgive me. That's not the life I want. I do want to be like Jesus. Can I pray with you now? And can you pray for sinners that you know that's in your life? You know that they're in sin, but just pray to God. God, let me understand what they're going through so I can speak to them with a confidence and assurance on a level that they can understand because they know that I understand now. So I can pray a deeper prayer for them. And maybe somebody here is saying, you know what, I, I, I need to accept Christ. I'm not there. I need him. You know what, he left heaven to come here because he loved you that much. And if you're willing to give your life to Jesus right this minute, which he says there's, today's the day. That's what the Bible says, today's the day of salvation. All you do is ask him. He says, I'm at the door and I'm knocking. That's what that, that feeling inside where you're squirming and your stomach feels weird and your heart and you're arguing with somebody in your head and you don't even know. It's because you're arguing with God and because he's saying, hey, I want to come in. And you're saying, I'm not sure. <laughs> My house is dirty. <laughs> he's saying, if you open the door, I'll come in. We're going to sit down. We're going to eat. We're going to have some, we're going to have fellowship together. If you want to open the door, this is how you do it. If you believe that he is God, he came here as one of us. He died on the cross. He defeated death. He rose again. And now he is at the throne in heaven. And his spirit lives within us once we call on his name. If you believe that, then you repent of your sins. You repent of being this person that you were without him. And now you say, I want you. I want fellowship with you. You're reconnecting with God, your creator. He says he'll come inside of you. He'll live inside your heart and he'll help you become the person that he created you to be. That's how you open the door. You repent and you believe. You can pray a prayer like this. You can say, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are God. And that you came here as one of us to pay the price on the cross. You died and you rose again so that I can have eternal life. 